Hey, deserving listeners. Today, I'm going to answer patron emails. This first email is from an anonymous anonymous patron. She writes, "I am um, I am an extremely controlled, emotionally absent human being with an overactive nervous system. I developed a habit of finding strangers on the internet to have sex with, which would send me into a dissociative state." where I no longer had to feel anything. The more I did this, the more I discovered that certain things made me made me dissociate stronger. I'm basically two distinctly different people, completely separate. I like particularly violent interactions. I like impact. I like being hit. And I discovered that if an encounter was intense enough, there was a pivotal, pivotal moment where I could totally release myself and sob uncontrollably. It was like in that moment, my two selves were coming back together and the reality of what was happening was overwhelming. I know this sounds a lot like BDSM, bondage and submission, but it's not the same. I look for dominant types, dom types, because they understand the impact I'm looking for. But when I'm with them, they can tell something is not normal about me. My therapist thinks I'm re-traumatizing myself with these encounters. What I would really like is to find a therapist who could use physical compression or impact or touch to help me get to the emotional place without subjecting myself to these unpredictable encounters with strangers. 10 out of 10 therapists I've contacted will not agree to any such kind of touch at all. Is this a real thing? impact for a therapeutic benefit? Can a therapist touch a client? Are they out there? Is my language even correct? Is there a way to des- to describe what I need in order to get what I'm looking for when I talk to therapists? I don't want mindfulness. I don't want to do breath work. I don't want to just talk about it. I don't want a massage therapist. I want a mental health clini- clinician who can use my physical body to break down my impenetrable emotional barrier. End of email. So pretty interesting email here. Um, right. So if I'm, if I'm understanding right, you uh, suffer from dissociation and you, you're in therapy, which is great. And you probably also have dissociative identity disorder. Um, having two distinct selves. You can have dissociative identity disorder and just have two alters. You might even have more alters that you don't know about. It's, as people discover their dissociative identities, they uh, sometimes uncover like, oh, I, I guess I had more than two. Um, it's also possible that you will find that dissociative identity disorder doesn't really quite encapsulate your experience with dissociation. You might not really identify two different selves as you start to explore this. <clears throat> but either way, it's definitely in the dissociation camp and whatever label we to it, it will put to it, it doesn't really matter. You must have been through some significant diff- difficulties while you were growing up, and that led to the need to have a dissociative mechanism to protect you from those traumatic events as you were going through them when you, when you were young. And as an adult, you've tried to find ways to reintegrate the self, or at least for the two selves to be able to to know about each other. And one of the things that you found is that when you find people to have sex with, and they, um, ha- you know, they're they you can cons- use consensual BDSM essentially, where they. Um, use the, you know, their bodies and they impact you. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but some kind of physical domination, physical impact on you. You find that <clears throat> your, uh, it seems as though your two selves come together and you have this total release of emotional energy, this total catharsis, and you sob uncontrollably. And from your language, it sounds like that it feels very healing and very, um, healthy for you to have that experience. And when you go to therapy uh, from, again, reading, reading between the lines of your email, you actually cannot reach that place where you can release your emotions. And you find that uh, in therapy, as you talk about things, as you do mindfulness or whatever your therapist is recommending, 
you don't have any emotional uh, connection, and you you know, and so you describe yourself as an extremely emotionally absent, emotionally controlled uh, person. But you have this overactive nervous system where uh, all these things are going on underneath the surface. So what it sounds to me is that your uh, main identity, your main altar, your main self that is present most of the time, learned to deny emotions and to control emotions in a subconscious manner. So even when you try to identify with your emotions, you can't really access them because this is all a subconscious process. Then you have this other self that actually holds a lot of emotion and allows itself to uh, express those emotions. And when you <clears throat> have these intense physical experiences, uh, then uh, sexual physical experiences, then you find that you can actually access that emotional part of you. Uh, that's, you know, basically what you're telling me. So I'm just sort of paraphrasing what you're saying. I, I hope you talk with your therapist about this. Um, it's very important that you do that. Um, <clears throat> So you're saying that um, you're you're looking for a therapist to <clears throat> excuse me. I just had dinner, so <clears throat> a lot of stuff in my throat. I think so. You're you're looking for a therapist to to use touch. So most therapists they use talk therapy, and you're finding that that's not really helping because it just plays into your uh, automatic defense mechanism of intellectualization and denial of emotions. And you're, you're finding this, I need some kind of physical contact to, to, you know, make therapy actually work for me, which is good. It's good that you notice that about yourself. That's great. But you contacted 10 therapists and all 10 of them said they will not agree to any kind of touch at all. And now you're wondering, wait, do, do any therapists do this kind of stuff? Uh, because I, uh, I, I know what I'm, I have an idea of what I need in therapy and I, I'm not finding it in therapy. I don't want to do mindfulness. I don't want to do breath work. I don't want to just talk about it. And it's funny because as I was reading your email, I was like, huh, I wonder if a massage therapist would help, would help, you know, because that, that is physical touch for an hour or more that is considered ethical and therapeutic. And you, you say, I don't want a massage therapist. So it sounds like maybe you tried that and uh, it wasn't impactful enough or something, which, you know, makes some sense. If I did suggest it, I would say, you know, just give it a try. So basically um, what you're running into is our society is phobic about touching in general. You know, for two men, for example, to say two 45-year-old men who are friends, who are heterosexual, to walk down the street holding hands would be uh, extremely strange, right? In other countries, it's fine because why wouldn't you want to hold the hand of your friend? Why wouldn't you want that physical contact? Um, we're, we're one of the, probably in terms of the history of humankind, um, and maybe even particularly in Seattle, we're some of the most phobic touching people. In fact, a lot of times what you'll hear people say when they do see people touching or they hear about people touching each other, they will immediately um, talk about how creepy it is and how creepy it sounds. You know, like, like one of the things that uh, I will bump up against sometimes is when you work with kids as therapists, there's t there tends to be a lot of touch that just happens uh, automatically. And when I say that to some people, they, they sort of cringe. They're like, what, you know, cause like, I'll, I'll talk about myself. I'll be like, um, you know, when I would work with five-year-olds or seven-year-olds or 10-year-olds, um, yeah, I would touch my clients. And just that phrase alone will trigger people. They'll be like, oh, what do you mean? You're a man and you're touching your, these children. And, you know, are, are some of them girls? Like you're touching these girls. And it, it, it automatically sets off this alarm system in people, which is, which is stupid. Uh, what's, what's wrong with touching people? Now, some touching is bad, but most touching is not. <laughs> some people are predators as they touch. They're grooming people. 
but most people are not predators. The vast, vast majority of people are not sexual predators. Now, do we have problems in our society with non-consensual touch? Do some people touch too much? Joe Biden, for example, when people should you know, keep their hands to themselves or make sure that other people are okay with it? Yeah, I mean, that's a thing for sure. But you know, most touch is fine and and doesn't cross boundaries and can actually be extremely therapeutic. And so, you know, we live in this phobic culture. And just to clarify about kids, if you don't know, any of you clinicians who do work with kids, you know this, but when you work with kids, you don't just sit on a couch and talk. You know, a five-year-old doesn't talk about their problems typically. So you get down on the ground and you're playing with toys and Legos and puppets and cards and Jenga and you know, throwing a ball and you're, you're doing stuff like that. You're playing on the ground with the kid. And sometimes, you know, the kid, they're five and they have attachment issues and they want to be attached to you. So they just like stand up, walk over and they just hug you or they want to sit next to you um, at, while they kind of touch you. You know, they want to sit directly next to you or they, they want to hug you at the end of the session or they want to hug you at the beginning of the session. These are all touching moments. These are all moments in which the therapist, and me included, would be touching clients. And that is not only normal, but it can be extremely therapeutic. So, uh, and that's just the reality. <clears throat> but anyway... So I, this is all just to say that we live in a, in a touch-phobic society, and our profession of psychotherapy exists within that touch-phobic culture, and thus uh, our field is touch-phobic as well, in the same way that we live in a racist culture, and thus um, the field of psychotherapy can be nothing other than racist because we just live in a racist. It's not like psychotherapy exists outside of American culture. It exists inside of it. So, so we are a touch phobic uh, profession in general. Having said that, there are some people who have seen the light and get training and education, have ethical codes. There's a whole field of what we, of what we call using touch and therapy or somatic therapists, dance mu- movement therapists as well. There's various different words. So you're asking me, patron, what language am I looking for? And the language you're looking for in all likelihood is the word somatic, which just means body. And what you're looking for is somatic therapist or body work therapist. Now, this is a pretty, um, there's a wide variety of clinicians. If I just Googled somatic therapists or body work therapists, I would get a wide variety of competence, a wide variety of approaches, a wide variety of philosophies. It's sort of a kind of a wild west in some ways. Some of them will be operating within the ethical codes and some of them won't. And so, but that's the field you want to go into. If you want to Google something, look for a somatic therapist. Um, And also I would ask them prior to beginning therapy, how they gauge touch, what what do they do with touch. I would tell them specifically what you want and why and and gauge their response. If they seem to have a a pretty good uh, response to it, like they're not afraid of what you're asking and they have a clear idea of how to facilitate treatment for you, then that might be someone to experiment with. But if but if they don't really have a very good answer, then, you know, it's 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 less um, you know, you're less assured that this therapist knows what they're doing and has a good approach. Because some people have very a, a lot of experience, again, a lot of training, a, a lot of clear ethical, um, you know, guidelines that they follow regarding using touch and therapy. And they really know, and, and they would immediately know what you meant when you said that you, because of dissociation, wanted physical impact, some kind of you know, very big impact. What What is likely ha- happening for you, and again, there's no way to know this. In some ways, this is psychobabble I'm, I'm about to say, but the way I see it is when we're uh, conceived up until the time that we're, I don't know, two or two years old, maybe a year old, we are often restrained and held by our parents. Think of the, you know, the swaddling clothes that you put on a newborn, you, um, you know, you swaddle the, the newborn in 
a blanket and the, the infant can't move their arms or legs. They're completely, um, you know, tied up essentially. They're restrained. And this can be extremely, um, uh, this this can be very pleasurable to a child in that they feel like they're being cared for, like they're being held, and it, it relaxes them, it makes them feel safe. And uh, and there's lots of other experiences that can that are similar to this, like when you're um, you know nine months old and you are standing up and you're trying to do some mobile action and you fall down and you hit your head and you're scared in that moment most kids will want to be picked up and held by their parents right they want to be held close to the body they want they might even want to be held really tightly so that's a instinct instinctual desire that we have and we associate it with safety and we associate it with um, I don't know a lot of good things and uh, love and attachment so if your trauma happened during those phases of life, it's possible that you have a pretty big part of you that's still waiting for that need to be met. And the only way that it, given your lifestyle, you have found that need to be met is by meeting uh, BDSM males who will um, you know, do things to you that are that have that sort of adult sexual uh, similarity, maybe through um, mock strangling or they lay on top of you or they restrain you or, you know, it's all consensual. It's not done, um, not non-consensual, but it, and if they have a certain intensity around it, then I'm guessing that regresses you to that place when you wanted to be swaddled and held when you were young. And then all of a sudden your body is allowed to develop and heal from six months old to say two, two years old. That's always, that's the way I always kind of look at it is when we're relationally traumatized growing up and all of us have just a little bit of it, we need to regress back to that point in our adult life and redo it. And once we get that need met, then we can move forward and we have less of a need to regress and thus we um, mature and have less reactivity in situations, less immaturity in situations. And so uh, you've just found in your life that, wow, when I do this, it, it, it's like the only time that I ever get this kind of thing. And so I could imagine why it would be quite compulsive to want to recreate it. Now, if you had a partner uh, a long-term partner or a friend, it's also quite possible to engineer that with them as well. So I'm not, because uh, in your in your mind, it's like, well, I can either, you know, you started off this email saying that you meet random strangers on the internet to have sex with, which is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's, you know, pros and cons to that kind of lifestyle. It's also possible that if you just had a partner, a long-term partner who knew how to do this sort of thing, um, even if it was just a sexual relationship, uh, it seems like that would maybe facilitate a little bit more safety and, um, I don't know, continuity over time with someone who could do that for you. You can even have friends do it, not necessarily sexual things, but they could swaddle you and hold you down and hold you, these kind of things. Um, I don't know. You obviously should talk with your therapist about it. I have no way of knowing that these things about you, but these are ideas you could explore with your therapist. You also talk about, you know, wanting a therapist to do these kinds of things. And it's really unknown. Uh, I think you're at the beginning of this discovery. There's, if you find a somatic therapist that does body work, or even, like I said, even a dance movement therapist, because they don't necessarily put hands on you, but they can do things where you can feel like their hands are on you. It's hard to explain, but, um, well, maybe I should explain. Like a dance movement therapy intervention might involve... Um, them wrapping you up in something and then um, putting a rope around you and then a rope around them. And then you just uh, lean backwards while you uh, feel the tension of the rope, sort of like tug of war. And so you're not, you don't 
uh, you're not in physical contact with your therapist, but you can feel your therapist's body because you are both tethered to this rope. Anyway, so there's a lot of different things that you can do and experiment with that might actually facilitate you healing and um, returning to that regressive state so that you can develop. Um, so now there's a line though that even the most liberal somatic therapist, I would hope, will not cross. Obviously, they're not going to have sex with you. There's going to be certain somatic interventions that you might want that they aren't willing to do because it's just too risky uh, for good reasons and for bad reasons. Good reasons because we don't want to cause client harm. Bad reasons because we have a society that's phobic about touching. So that's what I would say is talk with a somatic therapist, get a consultation. Um, in the meantime, you know, keep going to your current therapist and talking about it. There's a lot of ways to approach dissociation. Um, so I, I commend you for trying. I commend you that you are like, I want to I wanna do something about this. Um, and you deserve to heal. But the, and, I, and, it, and I absolutely, I would experiment with somatic work. In the meantime, keep talking. Find someone that's good with dissociation. <clears throat> you, you, at the end of your email, you're like, I don't want to do mindfulness. I don't want to do breath work. I, I wonder if this is some comment on your current therapist approach. Um, you know, there are some therapists who really focus on mindfulness and, and breath work and that kind of stuff. And that's great. But it's possible that um, your talk therapist doesn't know the other ways to use talk therapy to actually help you with dissociation. There's a lot of ways to approach dissociation, essentially, and to approach trauma. And it's possible that your therapist doesn't know all those ways. And so, um, again, I would talk with your therapist and I would stay with that person. But, um, um, you know, I, I might get a second opinion even about your talk therapy. Uh, you say all, you said something else that I thought, oh, you said that your therapist thinks that you're re-traumatizing yourself with these encounters. So it's possible that you are. Uh, it's also possible that you're not. The, the way to know is if, or how do I explain this? The, the main thing you want to explore is uh, your, essentially the distress you feel in any given moment. When we have heightened distress, like on a scale from one to 10, when you're like an eight, or nine or 10, then you run the risk of actually re-traumatizing yourself. If it's like a four or a five or below, then yeah, it's distressing, but it's not potentially re-traumatizing to you. Now, it, you know, this isn't a science, it's hard to lock this down, but that's one of the questions you wanna ask yourself is, how much distress, how much terror am I going through? Because it's possible that given your emotional um, issues that it's hard for you to know your emotions or express them. It's possible that you are <laughs> re-traumatizing yourself in these moments because you're desperately looking for some way to heal and to you, this is the only way to do it. It's possible that you are re-traumatizing yourself, but you don't really know because a long time ago, you learned not to be connected to your feelings because it was helpful to cut, be, cut yourself off from your feelings. So, it, you know, your therapist could be right about that. There's just a lot of unknowns here at this point. I think you're at the beginning of your treatment um, path. Uh, you, def, you, you know, you've, you've come a long way in that you know you have an issue. You know how to talk about it. You, you're starting to connect with your needs. You're starting to know the kind of therapy you want. You're starting to assert that. That's all great. But you have a lot of discovery ahead of you. I suspect. And so uh, just proceed with caution and with the advice of your therapist. All right. So let's get to some other emails. But before we do that, I just want to say that the rest of this episode is just for patrons of the podcast. So if you want to hear my response to more emails that I'm at probably another hour or two of email responses, you have to become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. That's patreon.com. Become a patron of the podcast You'll get access to the rest of this episode, as well as hundreds of other episodes that are patron only. We, we've we made uh, almost a thousand episodes, and I think, I don't know, three or 400 of them are patron only. 
arguably our best episodes. So go to patreon.com, become a patron of the podcast, and you will be able to listen to the rest of this episode. So do it now. Do it, do it, do it. 